Now we're going to switch gears and talk about one of my favorite subjects, transition distances. This has got to be the most misunderstood thing in the conveyor business. Everybody has had a problem with it. Some people know they have a problem. Some people don't know they have a problem with it. But sooner and later, you're going to find a majority of conveyors have improper transition distances, especially when you get around quarries and sand and gravel pits and places like this where they kind of do their own on-the-fly engineering sort of business, you know, don't work through the proper uh, SEMA standards on this. For let's first decide what transition distances are. We know that the conveyor belt is going to be troughed. It's got the three cans, and we have the conveyor belt that's flat. We're twisting up, canting up the edges. In doing so, we're increasing the uh, capacity of the conveyor belt, right? We can put more material on the conveyor belt. And as we go through the system, we got the loading zone. Now we're going to take the conveyor belt from this canted up down to a flat where it comes around the tail roller. So the conveyor belt is, is really flat, right? It's going around the tail roller, coming around the system. As it starts to go around the system now, the edges are being twisted up gradually through several idlers over a distance. And as they're twisted up on the edges, you can put more capacity in the belt, more load. But that twisting puts a lot of stress on the conveyor belt, more than you'd ever think. It has to be done force over time, right? We have to have a certain amount of time for this modulus of rubber to fabric to, to kick in and do its work. So we know we have a transition area. We know we have idlers that are different between load supporting and transition idlers because we gradually camp the edges up. So if the head pulley, and you might be a little hard to see this photo, but we'll show you some software to help you this a little better too, get your head kind of around it. At the head pulley, commonly you'll see somebody maybe put a, a, a 35 degree idler, you know, full troughing idler, right, 35 degree canted idler, right up next to a head pulley. In other words, it would be within a few inches from the discharge point because that particular quarry says, well, listen, I don't want to spill product as I discharge one to the belt to the other, so I want to make really sure that I've got the belt canted up to the very last moment as it falls off the conveyor onto the next system through the chute, I minimize my spillage. Well, in theory, it all sounds good, but what they're doing is putting a huge amount of stress on the edge of the conveyor belt at its highest tension, right, the short transition, and so you'll get this pulling. The belt will pull itself down a gravitational force pulling itself down into those idler junctions, accelerating the idler fatigue we talked about, accelerating the splice life fatigue, this sort of thing. So let's look at that. So what Mike's referring to is the idler or the transition distance, not only at the loading area, but at the discharge point. So when it goes from the tail pulley to fully staged, and when it goes from fully staged over the head pulley. Okay, so we're talking about, simultaneously, you're talking about two different transition distances, or, yeah, two different locations. Now let's go to the tail roller and examine some ideas here. If we might have seen this, a lot of you guys might be in the field and at some point seen a belt that looks like this. The tail roller is right here just out of the photograph, the very end of the, the belt, and we have this bump in the conveyor belt, this hump in the conveyor belt. When you see that, right away, we know that that's telling us there's zero tension, most likely a negative value, a compression, right in the middle of this conveyor belt. Because as the conveyor belt goes to this system, the strains, we'll show you how the strain works, we're putting so much force on the edge of the conveyor belt over such a short amount of time, the fabric doesn't have a chance, because of the elastic modulus, the amount of force it takes over time to stretch or elongate that fabric, to work properly, overloading the edges, Gravitational forces are pushing the edges down, creating a negative value in the middle of the conveyor belt. Now, what's, what, what do we say earlier? What's the one thing that eats up conveyor belts faster than anything? Tension or compression? compression. We showed you compression. It's a killer. Do you think this would be a belt killer pretty fast, a splice killer? Absolutely. Now, what if we added weather values into this? What if we got a really cold snap? Do you think the belt would have a little less modulus, be a little stiffer? Absolutely. You guys have ever wondered, now maybe not in Mexico, but <laughs> other places, you might have even might have noticed that, uh, especially where you guys are at, you might have noticed that, hey, the first cold snap of the year, everything's gone fine all summer, the first cold snap of the year, you get this rash of phone calls from these customers all with belt and splice problems, delaminations, all, it's a big stress, and they're all upset, and it all kind of happens fairly quick. Do you think that cold snap was, Coincidental, or you think it had a factor in 
accelerating this problem? Absolutely. Everything goes through what's called glass transition. The glass transition is essentially where the molecules in whatever component changes from a free-flowing moving material, right? In other words, the electrons are moving around the, 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 the center of the molecule and it slows down. The colder it gets, the slower it gets to the point it stops moving. So if I have water, at room temperature, the water is liquid, right? At 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, what happens to the water? It freezes. It changes states. The water goes from a liquid to solid glass transition. So at that exact point, water goes to glass, right? And it goes to glass. It can't free flow because the molecules have stopped moving. They become rigid. At that point, water now has become a problem for us. Everything goes through glass transition. Everything goes through it at different levels, some at higher temperatures, some at much lower temperatures. A, a neoprene conveyor belt, a neoprene conveyor belt will go through glass transition quicker than a natural base conveyor belt. It has a little, a little less resistance to that, that effect, but all conveyor belts are going to go to this. They become stiffer. So when we look at these glass transition factors, we know that extreme heat will soften the rubber, elongate it, speeds it up, right? We know that real extreme cold, glass transition at the downside will stiffen it up and break it down. And all these things can be accelerated through these tight transitions. Let's do this. Let's work through a couple scenarios and show you and map out how these forces are coming to this conveyor belt in these transitions. Two things we've just talked about, or Mike's just talked about, is troughability. The belt isn't, it doesn't trough. It isn't enough flexibility in it. You can't track it. The other thing we're talking about then is load support or the ability to handle load without going into the idlers. This is one key for all you guys that look at conveyor systems and work with conveyor systems. Your idlers will tell you what's going on. If you look at an idler and you're just burning off a little bit of the paint right here in the center of this, this roll in the center of the center roll, just, just a little skiff. In the, uh, in the center of the belt, or the uh, idler roll, you can be sure that that belt's not laying flat against it and it's not getting enough support. So if you're having tracking problems with that, piece of si with that conveyor system, first thing you look at is, do you have, is your belt too stiff? Because it's just not making the contact. On the other hand, if you're in chance, you have chances you're gonna make three belts out of one. If you look right down here in the idler junction, just where the idlers end, the rolls end. If you look at the end of those and the paint goes right off and you don't have any paint right up the edge of it, that means your belt's running down into that V and you better take care of it. It just doesn't have enough load support. Two indicators for you and they're the fastest and easiest things you can find. Because you walk up the conveyor system, you look at the idlers and it says, okay, I think I know what your problem is. It makes you look really smart. I wanted to share a real life uh, story real quick. In fact, I was working with Bob at, at uh, your outfit. We got a phone call, his distributor salesman got a phone call and uh, uh, eventually got to me. And the customer was complaining that our mechanical fasteners were chewing up their belt cleaners. That's, that, that was the problem that we went to. And it was just, this was a ready mix plant, a relatively new ready mix plant. In other words, it was only, what, six, eight months old in operation? And already, they were having this concern that their urethane bladed uh, belt cleaner was getting chewed up by our fasteners. So we go take, do a site visit. We look at the head pulley, and we see how the fasteners are interfacing with the belt cleaner and are banging into them. We go, then go look at the tail pulley, and we see that the transition distance has been violated significantly, and we get this compression that we're seeing. What it did was create a memory in the belt so that the splice could not lie flat through the entire cycle. It was in a wave. And so we, now we have a, 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 an increased profile of the splice, which interfaces poorly with the mechanical fastener, or with the uh, belt cleaner. And the belt cleaner urethane is getting chipped away and marred and everything else. They want to they wanna blame the performance of the mechanical fastener. But the real issue going on was a violation of the transition distance. And I bring this up to you just so you know that you might go out to a site on a specific problem, but that problem may be a symptom of a greater issue that's going on. That same compression 
shape that you see there. Maybe they had some mechanics drop the pulley down. It's sitting on some horses for you when you show up. But it's like typical diamond leg pulley. You'll see that transfer to that drive where you'll have a diamond, a smooth diamond, smooth, and then a diamond. And so therefore, maybe you might not even be on the system. You might be in their garage doing this. You can identify just by the wear patterns, not only an idler, but the wear on the drive itself that can tell you that you have a, a system, you know, compression problem on there. And we're going to show you how that looks just exactly in a minute. And here's the thing about it. Just think as you're on the job selling your company to this customer, doing business, selling products, whatever, and immediately you can walk up and see this product. The guy says, hey, I want you to like this roller, give me a price on it. You look at that idler, we'll show what it looks like, this, this drive roller, the lagging. You see this identif very identifying wear pattern, and right away you can turn around and say to the guy, I bet you got splice problems with this system. He's going to say, well, yeah, I do, actually. How do you know? Well, now you can go through this process and explain to him why you know. Again, you're learning the right questions to ask, right? You're becoming more viable to the customer, more important. Because in this business, what we see so much is that everybody wants to work off price and just dries everything down to the point nobody makes money at all, and everybody starts going out of business, right? And right now in this economy, you better look off uh, something besides price because things are getting tougher by the day. Let's, uh, let's take an example, just kind of get your head around this concept. Let's say we have a, a small little flat conveyor, a little something flat belt, nothing special about it. And this belt, uh, we was to measure the distance around this conveyor belt. Let's call it 100 feet. So we got this little small conveyor belt. We measure the distance around the center of this belt. It's 100 feet around the length, right, total in this length. We take the same conveyor belt now, so we got the same system. But this time, we're going to add some troughing rollers to it on the load-carrying side and cant up the edges. Remember we talked about how the belt, we cant it up on the edge? If we was to measure around that conveyor belt now on the edge, would the edge still be 100 feet around the edge of that system? It's a greater distance, isn't it? It can't be. So for purposes of discussion, let's just put 107 feet. What did I do to that conveyor belt on the edge versus the center to get that extra seven foot of length out of that conveyor? Stretched it. Stretched the fabric. So I've taken that fabric we talked about and I'm starting to put more load onto it, elongating it, because I've got a greater length to run, right? A greater distance. When you look at the, uh, the cross view of this, the belt's canted up on the edge. We know the center, it's about 100 feet around the center. The edge is about 107 feet around the edges. We know the difference between the two is Extra tension. We got more load, more force, more tension on the edge of that conveyor belt because we got a greater length to run, right? There's two common transition types. Typically, you'll have what's called fully troughed and half troughed. You'll see this at the tail roller pretty commonly. You'll see this at the head pulley pretty commonly. And we'll show you why both have value and both have shortcomings. But fully troughed, essentially, the center of the conveyor belt is pretty much in line with the top of the tail roller. And the edge of the conveyor belt now is moving away up to the transition. And half troughed, it's the same thing except the pulley, typically head pulley now, is lifted vertically on some plates of steel. So they got some steel shims and spacers under the pillow block. They lift it up about three and a half inches, not much, maybe four inches. And in doing so, they've changed the forces in the conveyor belt to where the center of the belt is not too far off the center of the pulley. And what it does for us, it starts to straighten the forces out. It makes the total width of the conveyor belt have a little more even forces across it. Not perfect, but you'll see some scenarios why. So we can see these two things. Well, let's do this. Let's do a, uh, a what if. Let's say at the tail roller, we're looking down on the conveyor belt straight down, got our lagging, right? And our conveyor belt is going through a tail transition, fully troughed, and what it's doing is it goes through this cycle, the edges, because the belt's flat, comes around the roller, right? So it's flat, as it goes around the roller, the edges start to cant up, as the edges cant up on the conveyor belt over some distance, some length, we're applying force and load on the edges to stretch it, as you stretch and pull force and load on the conveyor belt, twist of the sides, 
So we know that the distance is going to be relevant to the amount of force on the edge of that conveyor belt. So here's our conveyor belt running 600 feet per minute. And our tail transition goes from a fully trough 35 degree idler. He's the 35 degree idler on the tail roller. We're a 48 inch wide conveyor belt, right? Decent sized conveyor belt. And it's fairly close. So I have to be at 600 feet per minute. This particular point of fabric in the conveyor belt is flat, leaves the tail roller going into the load, shot, load cycle into the chute and it has to stretch and elongate and trough up very quickly, right? Can you imagine how fast that's going over that short distance? Can you imagine how quickly you're putting stresses in the edge of that fabric? Those are the more speed you're putting the stresses on, the more forces, right? Same thing, same scenario, but now we've doubled that distance, tripled that distance, the belt's flat. I have more time for this fabric to work as it's been woven and designed to do, to go up to its trough configuration. Do you see how the amount of distance is relative to the amount of force it's going to see on it? That force, we was to draw it, those forces on a really poor tail transition are going to look like this. We're going to see a lot of load, a lot of load on the edge of the conveyor belt, and we're going to have a lot of load on the edge of the conveyor belt and not much in the middle. Uh, so as we load up the edge of that conveyor belt, load up the edge of the conveyor belt, load and force, load and force, these tension lines, you can draw them right into the conveyor belt. So we're going to have a lot of stress in the edges, not a lot in the middle, if any. Now, when I get to the uh, roller, so let's say we're at the head pulley, fully troughed the head pulley, that configuration. As the belt comes in contact with the head pulley, at this point, is it viable for the conveyor belt to go around that head pulley and have these kind of loads into the fabric of the conveyor belt? In other words, a lot of stresses on the edges, not much in the middle, maybe even some compressing forces in the middle possibly. It's like a lot of stresses and a lot of forces on the edge and I come to that roller, the belt's coming in contact with that roller. The roller is rotating so it's dynamic but really it's static. Coming in contact with it, boom, now can I go around that roller with these abnormal U-shaped stresses in the fabric, would that work? It would break the belt, wouldn't it? You would pretty quickly put crimps in the fabric and break the fabric down. When that belt comes in contact with that roller, within a, whoops, wrong color, within a very short amount of time, I have to have pretty much even forces across that rotating roller, right, stresses, in that fabric. If I don't have fairly even stresses, I can assure myself a fast breakdown of the conveyor belt fabric over time. So that means that my conveyor belt now comes in contact with this point within a few milliseconds of operation in a short amount of time, I got to equalize the load in that fabric, don't I? Well, is the conveyor belt elastic? It's a rubber material, right? The fabric's elastic, it's designed to stretch. So think about it as a rubber band. I've got this rubber band stretched out, but now real quickly in this point of contact, it's got to come together really fast. So would it be viable to say that I'd get some skipping, some sliding, some squealing? Think about this conveyor belt coming in contact with the roller at that point. I get this really short transition, a lot of forces on the edge. It comes in contact with the head roller as it rotates. The center has to catch up with the rest of the edge of the conveyor belt. You get those even forces across that pulley face. In doing so, within a few seconds, right, in a short amount of time, that conveyor belt is going to overshoot slightly. It's always going to be working, overshooting, working, overshooting. As it works and overshoots, what would it do to the lagging on that roller? Would it wear it out pretty fast? Would it wear the bottom cover of the belt in the middle as well too, probably? Yeah. So as a good belt salesman, you've been trained by all the proper uh, distributors, and the first thing you're taught to do is sell them what? You get a belt that slips, they say, hey, listen, I got this slipping problem, I can hear a squealing sound, I go out to the belt as it operates, you have this high-pitched squeal, Belt slipping on it, right? So what do they tell you to sell? What's the one thing, what kind of lagging would you sell? So you got this really high wearing, very high coefficient of friction, coefficient of friction ceramic embedded chips in this lagging, this rubber. What do you think that's going to do? Have we fixed the problem or we just put a band-aid on the problem and create another problem? Yeah. Now we're going to eat the conveyor belt up really fast. Because somewhere in that area, somewhere in that system, there has to be a wear point. There has to be something that wears down. Do you want the lagging to wear down or do you want the belt to wear down? 
spoken like a true belt manufacturer. But no, I mean, fact is that we did a study when I was at Finner, and we did a study on some steel cord belts in Australia. And we found that through these bad transitions they had, and they went and put ceramic lagging on the system because they wasn't fully aware of this problem, they actually destroyed, took a sixteenth of an inch cover off a bottom of a multi-million dollar steel cord belt in about 72 hours. You think that wasn't a bit of a, a wake-up call? And of course they ran the belt and more cover come off and you know within a 60 day period of time, 90 day period of time, they're looking to replace this multi-million dollar belt because they've worn right to the cables. So you got to be careful that when you put the ceramic lagging on, yeah you're going to stop one problem but boy you could be creating yourself a whole can of worms later.